Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. We are so excited today. I am Alana, and today I have Dr. Peter Gray with me. I'm going to let him introduce himself, and then I'm going to, I'm so excited to share a quick story with you. Okay. Uh, so I'm Peter Gray, and uh, I'm a, an evolutionary psychologist, which means that I'm interested in human behavior and how that behavior came about by natural selection, our, our basic human instincts. Uh, I'm especially interested in the nature of uh, children and uh, most especially in those aspects of children's nature that uh, lead them to educate themselves, um, that lead them to be attuned to the world and learn what uh, they need to know to do well in the world that they're growing up in. And so that means I'm especially interested in curiosity and in play. And I think what we're going to be primarily talking about today is play, if I understand it correctly. We'll probably talk about so much of it. I feel like I could have so many conversations with you. Before we start, I just wanted to share with you, um, I shared on my stories this morning about um, how reading your book literally changed my life because as an educator, I was in the classroom and I was working for about a decade um, in the public education system. And after I had my first uh, child, I read your book, Free to Learn. And I literally was like, my mind was blown. And it totally shifted my perspective of everything about, I mean, I always had like a, I think I always had a very more progressive sense of education, but it just totally blew my mind. And it's, it's the reason why I ended up leaving the classroom. Um, and the reason why I ended up starting this uh, blog and this, this sort of education uh, space for parents to work to just educate them more around this kind of information so that they could make some different choices at home and with the way that they're educating their kids. And so I just literally, like, I am so excited to talk to you because it was such a pivotal moment for me. And it's something that I recommend. People always ask me for parenting book recommendations. And I'm like, you don't need parenting book recommendations. You need to read free to learn, you know? And it's, I'm like, just be prepared to totally have your your whole world like shifted and to, to really have a new understanding of so many things that are so crucial to the way that your child develops and all of this stuff. So I just wanted to share that with you, but also with the viewers. Um, it's just such an amazing book and I will definitely be putting it in the comments for people to, to purchase it because it is in my mind an absolute must read. Um, so I'm so excited to have you here. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just in general, like what you have to say about how play is is such an instinct for kids. And I am super curious. Part of what we talk about a lot with my play, learn, thrive is that um, children um, need play, right, in order to learn, and that's how they learn. And they, in order for them to become a thriving adult, they need to have this curiosity and they need to have this love of learning throughout the rest of their life. And how are we really um, setting them up for that success? And how are we being super intentional about creating these lifelong learners? And so I would love just to hear your thoughts about that and, and you know, any information you, you think parents really need to hear about what are those most important things that we need to be doing for our kids. Yeah, well, I mean, I could go on forever talking about this, um, but let me let me try to just present the basics. So, first of all, one thing we know is that play is the way that young mammals, not just young humans, but young mammals generally, practice the skills that they need in order to uh, grow up uh, as independent, successful beings in their species. Uh, what we also know is that those animals that have the most to learn play the most. Um, and so not surprisingly, human children play more than the young of other animals do when they're free to do so, when they're allowed to do so. Um, we have a prolonged childhood primarily because uh, compared to other species, primarily because we have to learn more <laughs> than others before we become fully independent adults. 
And so we need a longer period for play and exploration and uh, kind of that sort of development. This is the way, this is the biological way of looking at humans compared to other species, a hum, the human juvenile period compared to that of other species. Anthropologists who study children throughout the world um, in, especially in environments that don't have the kinds of um, restraints on children that our culture has, uh, report that children everywhere play enormous amounts of, uh, of the day, of, of every day. They're playing. They're playing with other kids and they're playing largely away from adults. Uh, this is normal childhood, apparently. Uh, anthropologists, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, anthropologists who have studied uh, children, uh, who've studied hunter-gatherer cultures, I did a survey of anthropologists some years ago, uh, and these were anthropologists who did their survey back um, kind of in the mid to sort of even almost to the late uh, 20th century when it was still possible to find groups of hunter-gatherers who uh, were still living a kind of pristine hunter-gatherer life. And every one of them told me that the children that they observed were spending almost all their time playing or free to, they were free to play all day long. It wasn't that they were always playing. They were, they were hanging around in hammocks and they were doing other things, conversing and so on. Not everything was mm -hmm. play, but they were free to play pretty much all the time. And, um, and some of them pointed out that, you know, by the age of four, uh, they're regarded as, uh, responsible enough to run off with the other kids, don't have to be watched all the time by adult. Uh, and that um, much of the play, although some of the, much of the play was around camp and uh, in, in the vicinity of adults, but a lot of the play was well away from adults. And, um, and, and when I asked them what they played at, you know, you could see that they were playing at some, to some degree they were playing at the skills that human beings everywhere have to learn but they're also playing at the particular kinds of skills that are important in the culture that they're growing up in. So for example, mm -hmm. in, a, in a culture that uh, where the men hunt a uh, big game with bows and arrows, the boys were playing at hunting big game with bows and arrows, shooting at butterflies where they're big game maybe, but and with little bows and arrows, but, and, le and they were learning to track by tracking mm -hmm. one another, tracking, the adults, there's no privacy because everybody's tracking one another <laughs> in a, a hunter-gatherer. Sounds, so, sounds like it's still the same because my kids definitely track me everywhere. <laughs> so the uh, so at any rate, the, the, the point I'm making is that children come into the world um, biologically designed to uh, play and to play in a wide variety of ways. Uh, when they have ample opportunity to play in all of these ways. I might say that they are particularly driven to play with other children away from adults. And I really have to emphasize this because we adults don't leave our kids alone <laughs> in our culture today. That's our biggest problem as parents. Mm -hmm. We don't leave our kids alone. We have this message that we're supposed to be in their faces all the time, yes. that somehow we're negligent parents if we're not always there for them. But what Mother Nature knows, and what you know, by I use Mother Nature as a as as the symbol for natural selection, is that um, children need to learn to get along without us. They yes. need to learn to solve problems themselves. They need to learn how to make friends. They need to learn how to deal with the bumps in the road of life without us always picking them up. And so that's why they are so motivated to play with peers, with other kids, and, I, and without adult interference. Uh, we may train that out of them so they become a little bit afraid of playing with others if we constantly intervene and tell them how dangerous it is out there and all of that kind of thing. So sometimes we may see kids who are afraid of that going out, but that's not natural for kids. Kids really who grow up very early on venturing away, by the age of four, venturing away and playing with others, they they continue to want, even, you know, I was a shy kid, but I still wanted to play with other kids and I overcame 
my I dealt with my shyness by learning yeah. how to get along with kids by doing that. So, so this is uh, this is kind of the the primary message I want to get across. Kids need to play with other kids, and they need to play independently of adults. Yes. And in our society today, we're not allowing them enough opportunity to do that. They need time. They need freedom. They need our trust <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, for this to happen. So um, I, I guess that's that. the primary message that I want to get across. I, I think, you know, one thing I'm actually thinking of, I, I do a regular blog for psychology today, and I'm actually have in my mind that my next blog post is going to be on the difference between the role of parents and the role of peers in children's uh, development. I think that, you know, because adults, not children, write all the psychology textbooks, the, the developmental psychology textbooks, and write all the, hold the podcasts and all of this where we talk about, we have all this discussion about parents, role of parents. Parents are so important in children's development. Well, yes, parents are important in children's development. But I think if children were able to be the child psychologists, <laughs> if children were doing podcasts, if children were the ones doing this, now I'm not saying that they're fully capable of doing it or able to do it, but they, you know, some of them could. The, um, more emphasis would be on peers than on parents. <laughs> and I think children. it's so interesting, like parents, for me, part of what I talk about is that parents have this incredible role in their child's life, but part of that role is stepping back. And part of that role is curating an environment where your ch- your child can go and play independently so that they can separate from you and, and giving them those opportunities to take risks and to play with mixed age groups. And um, it's part of the reason I love, like, for example, Montessori or more self-directed learning. Um, where children are really with different, you know, kids of different age groups. And I think we parents feel, like you said, so much pressure to always be looking at our kids, watching them 24 hours a day, constantly engaging with them. And I try to tell parents, listen, if you think about it like this, children are born to play, right? And the more that we interject ourselves as the adult, like that isn't play. That is an interaction between an adult and a child. And we are actually taking away their ability to play independently because we're constantly engaging with them and we're constantly trying to stimulate them, like holding toys in front of them and asking them what they're building and doing and getting on the floor with them. And it's like, then we we look back when they're four, five, six years old and we wonder why they can't play by themselves. And they're constantly asking us to play or you know following us around. And it's like, well, their whole life, all we did was try to stimulate them constantly. And so that's what they've become used to. And like you, we've kind of like driven their natural instinct of play out of them because we have been so overly involved in everything that they do. Um, And it's scary. I think for parents, you know, there's all this, like all this messaging out there around how dangerous things are and and all this. And, And we know from, from data that that's really not true. Um, but it's hard to like let your child go. So wh- what would you say are some of your, maybe your tips for parents about like how can they, what are some things they can do to let go a little bit? Or what are some things you can tell them to kind of really drill home, like how important it is for kids to to spend time, even if it's like they're in a playroom that's in another room away from you. You don't have to be sitting next to them and supervising them 24 hours, you know? Yeah. First of all, let me say that this idea that parents are supposed to be watching their kids all the time and somehow interacting with their kids, amusing their kids, that that the, the parents are so in charge of who children turn out to be. It's your fault if <laughs> something goes wrong in your child's life. This is all new. This is mm-hmm. not part of human history. In fact, it's it's only in Western culture, and of course, Western culture now spreads in some sense throughout the world, but it's only within the last um, four decades, maybe five decades, uh, it really began in the 1980s, this idea. 
So people who grew up uh, in the 1950s, as I did, or in the 1960s, 1970s, remember a very different kind of childhood than children are getting today. And it was a more normal childhood. It was more like children growing up everywhere throughout the mm -hmm. world, throughout time, which was that your mom said, get out of the house. Okay. <laughs> I don't want you around here. You're in my way. <laughs> you, you know, I, I grew up in northern Minnesota. Zero degrees outdoors was no reason to be indoors. Get out. And so, and, and if you read, I've also written about this uh, in another blog post, and there's actually a, a wonderful book by, uh, by uh, uh, Kelly Rutherford, uh, that looks at advice to parents uh, over the last hundred years in the United States in uh, magazines for parents. And um, the advice always used to be encourage independence. Your child should be walking to kindergarten. <laughs> Show them the way, <laughs> give them, if they don't remember their address, pin it on them so that they, they can ask a stranger, a stranger, mm -hmm. mind you, <laughs> to yeah. help them home. <laughs> uh, the advice was um, to older children, it would be, it's great if they have a part-time job, great if they have a paper route at age 10 or 11 or whatever the age would be. The advice was that recognition was that uh, it's important that children learn how to behave independently. It's important that they learn to solve their own problems, to do their own things. It was only really beginning, it's kind of in the middle 1970s, but then it accelerated in the 80s that the advice to parents changed. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. But parents today who, who young parents who were not themselves children in that earlier age, maybe don't even know that that was normal childhood then maybe don't yeah. even you know know that um that this is this was not always the view that you are you're a negligent parent if you're not watching your child all the time not always in control of what your child is doing in fact in the past they would the argument would be you're probably a misguided parent if you are always yeah. <laughs> watching your child so i, I wanted to make that point yeah. now given all of that and given the way society has changed i'm very sympathetic with parents who 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 because it's very difficult in our culture today to give children the freedom mm -hmm. that uh children had in the past um number one so when when my parents and even the even when my own child was a kid my own first son was a kid in the 1970s you could say, get out of the house, and you could be confident that there would be other kids out there too to play with. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and of course there's, it, and children wanna play with other kids. If you send your child out and there's nobody else to play with, you know, we might, we might wish that children just loved the great outdoors and they'd be happy to be out there all by themselves in the outdoors. But I don't. I think that the great outdoors is an acquired taste. <laughs> you know, it comes from playing <laughs> in the great outdoors. Children are not naturally drawn to that. They are naturally drawn to other kids. And if there's other kids out there to play with, yeah, then they want to be outdoors to play. But if you send them out and there's nobody to play with, and especially if they're really not allowed to go any place other than their own yard, because if they do, somebody might call the police and report, yeah. and then you'll have somebody show up on your door and accuse you of child negligence for letting your child walk off the yard all by himself or herself, something that happened all the time in the past. Yeah. The, um, so, so, but, so if the child is out there, and I've heard com parents complain all the time, well, he just gets on his iPhone or wants to get on his iPhone or he wants to come back in. Well, who can blame him? <laughs> you know, there's, nobody right? to play with. there's no one out there to play. There's, there's nobody else out there to play with. It's pretty boring just sitting out there, you know. It, yeah. and, and so, 
And the only way that we've allowed children to connect with other children is on the cell phone. And then we blame them for getting on the, on the cell phone. Right? Wow. Then it's we ask, then we blame technology because our children are getting on the cell phone when, they, when we've deprived them from opportunity to get together with their friends away from adults in any other way. And then, so yeah, the, it's like that's how they grow the up, right? We, yeah. so, like so they the, grew up with not being able to go out and play. And then we, like, it's like we, we condition this out of them. And then when we turn around and we're like, well, you know, what are you doing? You don't want to, you know, you're bored all the time or whatever. And it's like, yeah, like we, this is partly our own fault. Right. But I, like, I love what you said about like, there are, you know, even I was born in the eighties and I do remember like a very um, free childhood. We roamed our neighborhood and we played all different things and we made potions and we, we, whatever we were doing, we caught frogs and we, you know, just did all the things. And I know that that's not necessarily feasible, you know, based on where you live for every child, but there's always some sort of, um, some sort of way to allow kids to be playing together. But um, it's interesting because there are so many parents, like you said, who didn't grow up that way. And so it's almost like this massive cycle that they have to break because if you don't know, you don't know. Right. And so if you don't even know that this is what is important in childhood and this is what children should be doing and, and, and the reasons why behind it, um, then it's so much harder for you to break that cycle, right? You're, you get stuck in, um, and even as somebody who is very well versed in it, sometimes I look around and I'm like, am I doing the wrong thing? Like my, why am I, I'm not setting up these, you know, special, um, adult led activities for my kids all the time. And I, I am telling them to go play and, and we, my kids are extremely independent. And then I'm like, Oh my God, maybe I'm wrong. Like I, I don't see anyone else doing this. And it, it definitely, you feel that pressure, um, to find other families who are on the same page and who do understand the importance of it. So I feel like it is such a cycle for, for parents to break because many of them did not at all. And they themselves are lacking the um, skills, the life skills, right? They are lacking the, um, you know, the, the intrinsic motivation and the uh, time management and the, and the, you know, emotional regulation and social skills and all of that. So it's like hard for them because they're almost having to relearn all the skills that they never learned by growing up because they weren't able to play, which is just crazy. So, uh, so there's two issues in breaking the cycle. The first is for parents to recognize um, how valuable play is and why children need it. Parents naturally love their child, care about their child, want to protect their child, uh, want the best for their child. I think all, essentially all parents want that. Yeah. And you're constantly getting the message about uh, safety, uh, constantly getting the message that there could be some danger in your child being out there. So those dangers, as you said, are largely myth. That doesn't, not to say that it never happens, but it mm -hmm. rarely happens, mm -hmm. rarely happens. So the danger most parents are most afraid of is that some stranger is going to kidnap their child and mm -hmm. the child may be killed, may be sexually molested, maybe this is the this is the scene that people yeah. have in their heads that got planted in the 1980s when there were actually two cases of boys that were kidnapped and were eventually murdered in a gruesome way. And that was when uh, radio announcements went out about the danger of children out there. Well, this was just two cases. There are millions and millions of children who were out at that time, millions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two cases that got that this terrible thing happened. People are not very good at statistical mm -hmm. probabilistic reasoning. We're very good at thinking about stories and getting a picture in our head. And so you get this picture in your head. Oh, my God, what if this happened to my child? Mm -hmm. But you're not thinking, well, you know, it could happen. But the chance is one in, in, a, in a many millions, right? Yeah. And, they could get hit by lightning too, but you know, uh, even on a nice yeah. day, lightning might just cut them along. You know, yep. <laughs> these things do happen, and it's not your fault as the parent. It can happen, but it mm -hmm. is a tiny chance. Now, let me tell you about something that's a much bigger chance, 
that parents should be more worried about. Huge yeah. numbers of children today, compared to any time in the past, are committing suicide. Yes. Imagine if your child committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Why is this happening? Mm -hmm. The one thing we know is that ever since we began preventing children from having the freedom that they had in the past, as we've increasingly restrained children's lives, as we've re increasingly prevented them from free play, as we've increasingly prevented them from making real friends that requires that they be away from us, mm -hmm. as we've increasingly kept them in almost round-the-clock imprisonment. Now, that sounds strong, but think about it, that when they're in school, more than ever before, they're micromanaged in school. Mm -hmm. the recess has almost been cut out entirely, and even where there is some recess, it's highly regulated. Mm -hmm. They're hour, not a tag anymore. Lunch hour is no longer an hour. Mm -hmm. Even little children are being given homework that they never had before. Yeah. The school year itself is now, on average, in the United States, five weeks longer than it was when I was a child. So they're spending more and more time in school where they really are being controlled all the time. They're yeah. being told what to do. They're not free. Outside of school, they're spending more time on homework than they have in the past. And they're being shuffled around uh, from one adult-led activity to mm -hmm. another where they're being still told what to do by adults. When they're home, they're under, under what we might almost call home lockdown. Home arrest. <laughs> home arrest, exactly, because they're yeah. not allowed to leave the home. So imagine if you as an adult were subjected to all of that. Would you, wouldn't you begin to think life is not worth living? Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't, you begin, no wouldn't you become depressed? Wouldn't mm -hmm. you become anxious? Wouldn't you, be, wouldn't you have, have fantasies of suicide? So should it be any surprise that when we do this to our children, that our children increasingly are behaving this way? So I think that if parents could get this image in their head <laughs> yeah, to counteract exactly. that other image, they would begin yeah. to think, now, you don't want to be reckless with your kid, but you begin to think, well, what are the things my kid could be doing independently, safely enough? Let me think rationally about this. Let me not think out of a state of fear about this. Let me think rationally about this. Let me talk with my child about this. Maybe my child could be walking to school with friends or by himself if I, we could convince friends to do it. Maybe my child could be playing in the park with friends. Maybe there are other things could be doing. Maybe my child could be taking his or her bicycle out to, uh, to a friend's house without having to have me drive them and so on and so forth. All of these things that give children a sense of accomplishment that bring immediate happiness, that build the kinds of skills that create resilience later in life. Maybe I, maybe there are ways I can do this. It's not always easy sometimes. So one of the things that I think that parents can do is to get to know. So one of the, uh, one of the changes that's happened also over time is that we're families are more and more isolated from one another neighborhood groups don't exist as much as they used to. Many people don't really even know their neighbors. They don't know, you know, and so the kids don't know the neighborhood kids. Then the parents don't know the neighbor. And so for all you know, you know, that neighbor might be a child molester, you know. that. So one step is to get to know your neighbors and especially the neighbors who have kids. And then the next step is to talk with the neighbors about, uh, and I, I think it's often not hard to convince people, you know, wouldn't it be nice if our children had more opportunity to play together and to play together, with, you know, without us telling them what to do. And you could even <laughs> share them the data of the value of that. Most parents can get that if they're, you yeah. know. But, and, then, and, then, and then you say, so maybe we can we create a safe way 
for us to do the old fashioned thing of all send our kids outdoors, we'll have certain times and we'll, we're, we're just all agree. We're going to send our kids outdoors. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and they can play in the, in the yards, one another's yards. If it's a quiet street, they can play in the street. And if parents are worried about safety, we'll rotate. We'll have somebody, maybe it'll be a grandmother who doesn't have to go to work. Maybe it'll be somebody <laughs> in the neighborhood who'll sit out there. I think grandparents are ideal for this because grandparents are a little more laid back. back. They're a little more laid They're back. They're like, just do it. You're fine. <laughs> this is the value of grandparents. They're not yeah they love the kids they care about the kids they've got a certain degree of wisdom um but they're they're less likely to intervene partly because they grew up at a time mm -hmm. when they had a lot of freedom and they recognized the importance of freedom for kids yeah. so so but to have somebody sit out there just to just for safety purposes make sure there's no creepy people coming around or <laughs> make sure that that they're being careful about traffic and so on and so forth but not to tell them how to play not to solve minor quarrels that part of the part of the value of play is children learning how to solve those quarrels themselves not to be somebody to be tattled to right somebody comes and tattles to you say oh that you know that's an interesting problem how are you going to solve it <laughs> you know that, uh, what are you going to do about it instead of taking it as your responsibility as the adult make it the kids responsibility kids are pretty resourceful in figuring out how to solve problems that's the whole, that's part of the whole purpose of kids play is for them to figure out how to solve these problems rather than to go running to an adult to have the adult solve it so that's you know that's one kind of thing to do the other thing i can say is so I'm part of, I'm one of the founders, I'm not the principal founder, but one of the founders of an organization called Let Grow. And uh, Lenore Skenazy, who wrote a wonderful book called Free Range Kids uh, that uh, quite a number of years ago, is the president of the organization. And she and I and a couple of other people are founders of this nonprofit organization the purpose of which is to advise parents and also to work with schools about ways of bringing more independent activity to children's lives. So let grow is kind of short for let go and let grow. Let your children go. <laughs> Don't hold on to them all the time, right? And let them grow. And um, and so we read and so and so the the website of the Let Grow organization has uh, ideas for parents. Lenora writes a regular blog about that tells stories about how parents have uh, discovered ways to for for uh, for the kids' freedom. How kids are thriving by that. And it also has a page for schools. And we were working with schools. Uh, quite a number of schools uh, have um, developed programs that we have initiated, one of which is kind of the one that I uh, developed primarily as um, something that the schools call Play Club, which is an hour of free play at school, uh, usually either before school or after school classes begin. And all the in some of the schools, all the kids age, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade, this is typically elementary schools that do it all. There's some middle schools doing it, uh, are playing together. And uh, so there may be 150 kids playing. And the school opens up not only the outdoor playground, but the gymnasium, the hallways. You see kids running in the hallways, nobody telling them not to. Uh, maybe the art room, other rooms, all kinds of ways of playing. And the only rules during play club are uh, don't, don't hurt anybody, don't deliberately hurt anybody, and don't break anything that's valuable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the teachers who monitor are instructed while you're watching play club, you are not uh, teachers. You're not mm -hmm. there to teach them anything. You're not there to solve minor problems for them. You're not there to be tattled to. You're not there. It's not your job to tell them better ways to play. <laughs> yes, it's, it's just you're just you, there to be a body. <laughs> you are there. The, the, uh, the I sometimes I give two different uh, analogies uh, or uh, metaphors for this. One is that you are 
like a lifeguard on an ocean beach. You mm -hmm. are not there to you're not there to worry about minor scrapes and scratches. You're there to rescue somebody if they're drowning. <laughs> you know? So yep. if you if you see if you think there's a life in danger here, <laughs> and yeah. even then, unless it's absolutely immediate, count to ten to see if the kids don't solve the problem themselves. You know, mm -hmm. because that's the purpose of play is for kids yeah. to learn how to solve their own problems. I was a little worried that teachers wouldn't be able to do this because they're so trained, they're so oriented towards helping kids all the time. But I've been very impressed that teachers get it and they do yeah. stand back. And I hear from teachers and principals about how amazed they are when they stand back of how competent the kids actually are in solving their own problems and that they're glad they stood back and they're they're learning new things about the kids they're learning mm -hmm. you know that particular kid who they thought was a bully cuz he acts kind of like a bully in the classroom he's really sweet to the younger kids you know yeah. and he's really he's different and that yeah. that that kid who kind of is doll in the classroom boy he's brilliant out here when he's yeah. playing with the other kids so they develop a different attitude which actually enriches the way they're teaching and um and 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 the kids develop a different attitude about school first of all they're making more friends in friends in other classes they feel better about going to school we hear reports from parents who say uh, you know, I thought my child would not want to ever get up early to go to school because play club is, in this case, is before school. Mm -hmm. But my child reminds me every time before play club, there's play club tomorrow. Be sure. Yeah, that I know, I get early. Time, you know? Well, but that just so, speaks to like how natural that instinct is for them. They yeah, want how natural that. it is. That's what you they know, need. One of the things I often advise parents is so sometimes I'm asked by parents, so how many extracurricular activities should my child be in? You know, like little league and karate classes and Spanish and violin and, Spanish and, and violin and all of these things. And all the things. And my answer to that is the, the way to determine that is if if you're if you have to remember and remind your child that it's time to go to that, then your child isn't interested in it. Drop it. <laughs> it's up to the child to remember that. And if the child really wants it, the child will remember it. <laughs> if the yeah, child says, so true. I've, got, I've got piano lessons tomorrow, be sure and get me to piano lessons. That means the child wants yes. those piano lessons. If you have to remind the child, if you have to, and especially if you have to drag, you the drag child, them there, mm -hmm. then that, that, take them out, take them out of it. Yeah. Uh, the same with anything else. If if uh, if your child has to rem be reminded to go to Little League <laughs> and you have to take the child to Little League, even though it's just around the corner, <laughs> then your child doesn't really want Little League. <laughs> yeah. So, and children need to learn how to be responsible for themselves if they want something. And, and it's good to tell them that, you know, if... Maybe they can forget once and you will remind them, but tell them, you know, if this happens two or three times, that means you're not interested. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, um, it's true, right? When we are interested as adults in something, we make sure it happens and the things that really matter to do. us. We, we absolutely do. Yeah. We don't have to be reminded of the things that we really want and love. Yeah. And, well, and that's going to help them like lead into that, those passions and then become adults who, who, who are well-rounded and who do have their passions that they really, I feel like so much, so many adults even now are so um, disinterested in what they're doing for their careers and they're so unfulfilled and they're unhappy and they live these lives that they don't even love. And I want to be like, hello, yes, don't, you don't want that for your child, right? You know, you feel that way. How, let me help you see how you can change the way that you approach your parenting so that that doesn't happen to your kid, because that's not what we want for our kids. And, you know, it happened to a lot of us, but we've got to recognize that that's just not what we want. This is, this is reminding me of, a, of another really important purpose of play. So um, you're right that a lot of people are going on to careers that they just, 
they kind of got seduced into because it's a high paying career maybe or a high status career they were told this would be a good thing to go on to they but they don't love it we've got a lot of unhappy doctors out there we've got a lot of unhappy lawyers a lot of unhappy business expenses executives and so on and so forth who went on to these careers thinking primarily what they're thinking of is this is climbing the ladder you know like school is always climbing the ladder you have to make it to the next grade you're trying you're working for other people's approval you're working for that a for that status money in some sense beyond what you really need to live happily becomes a status symbol becomes the substitute for the a that career becomes a status symbol and and they're not thinking about what do i really love to do what do i and and how can i make a living at that so i have uh had the good fortune of um of conducting research with people who are growing up uh, in a very different kind of way who are have uh, been un, uh, homeschooled by the method called unschooling where they have a lot of opportunity to play and explore and pursue their own interests and the parents see it as their job to facilitate the child's interests rather than to direct what the child is doing and also to follow up on the graduates of um, of a school, a democratic school where children have are not segregated by age and they have lots of opportunity, pretty much like in a hunter gatherer culture to play and explore. And what happens in that situation is children play at a lot of different things. And in the process of that, many of them, probably the majority of them discover something that they're really passionate about. And they play a great deal at, at, of that. We could call it a hobby. We could call it an interest. But it's play because it's self-chosen. It's, it's rewarding to them. It's not always the smiley kind of play. It can be a very intense kind of play. I, you know, of, uh, and, so, and so as they become teenagers and they begin to think about, become, about the fact they're going to have not be supported by their parents all their life, and they begin to think about what they'll do for their career, a very common thing is they begin to think, so I, I really love this, whatever it is. For some people, it, it, might, be, it might be building things. They've been doing constructive play. And I know one person who became an inventor because he was involved in creating things his entire childhood. <laughs> and another uh, who really developed a, a love of mathematical puzzles. It was play for him and he played at it, became ultimately a professor of mathematics. Um, another who, a woman, a girl who loved playing with boats, uh, became a ship captain. Um, I could go on with dozens of such examples of that. But what I found is people growing up with ample opportunity to play, most of them now were in careers that they loved. They were not necessarily high status careers <laughs> because they, were, they, they weren't growing up oriented towards status. They were growing up oriented towards, I want to enjoy life and I want to do things that are meaningful to me and I want to do things that are useful to the world because that makes it meaningful to me. <laughs> And that's a different orientation from I want to grow up to to do the thing that is kind of the equivalent of getting an A in a class, <laughs> you know, getting everybody, getting mm -hmm. other people's approval, doing what other people are expecting me to do, r climbing that ladder of status all the time, which can lead to misery. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's that status is not as rewarding as people might think it is. What is rewarding is day to day, the day to day rewards of doing something that you love and that you think is meaningful and that you think is contributing in some way to the world. And and I and I think that it's in play and self directed exploration that children discover this. Yes, absolutely. I love that so much. Okay, well, we are getting towards the end. So I would just say if there's any last little piece of information or encouragement that you want to leave for parents, I would love to, to have you drop any little last piece of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> 
we could talk about this for so long. I'm like, I'm already thinking about like, we could do 10 more shows. We could do a show about this. We could do a show about that. Um, <laughs> so, so I'll have to have you back on. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that, I think that the biggest thing that I would suggest to parents is put yourself in your kid's shoes. <laughs> think about what it is, uh, what it would be to be a kid. <laughs> yeah. Think about what you would want. Think about your own childhood. What do you treasure from your own childhood? You know, when I sometimes I'll ask when I'm speaking to a group of parents, I'll ask parents to um, to think about and even jot down a memory that they have from their childhood that that might be something that um, that a it, th that would be considered to be a peak experience, something that was just really revolutionary, kind of in your own development, something that you think back on, something that was really a special experience. And, uh, and then I have them kind of share them with one another in small groups and report on them. And what I find is that in almost every case, that peak experience occurred when that child, when there were no adults around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think there's a reason for that. Children feel diminished when there's an adult there. It's not necessarily a bad thing because the adult is a more powerful, bigger person. <laughs> the mm -hmm. adult is in some sense in control. You're not in, and, but when you are, out there with other kids or by yourself, you are in charge. You are you. You are, you are the one who is experiencing all this. You are the one. This is your world now, not your, yeah. not that adult's world. You're not some subservient part of that adult's world. This is your world. Yeah. And so that's why I think, and so I think when adults think about this, I have yet to meet an adult who doesn't say that, my memories of play are my most important memories that these were ex these these were these play uh, accounts for a good deal of who i am as long as i'm talking with parents who had opportunity to play mm -hmm. and there are actually now a lot of studies on the retrospection that show this statistically that this is the way people think about it. so think about that yeah. <laughs> um so i think that's part of it the other final thing i can say is if for people who want to um, follow any of my work, that there's a number of ways to do it. Um, yes. I write a regular blog for, for Psychology Today. Uh, easy, you can easily find that. Just Google Peter Gray Psychology Today. Uh, I have a web page, a relatively new web page, in which uh, many of my academic articles are easily downloadable as PDFs and. Um, so you can, and you can find that easy. It's just petergray.org. Um, and so if you're interested in looking at any of those, uh, any of those articles, um, they're easily available. And um, I've also started a new um, Substack. Uh, people were advising me to get on Substack. And um, so I've, uh, I've started a Substack. Uh, uh, I'm calling it a series of letters about play. And the, or, and the uh, title of the Substack is Play Makes Us Human. And that. so that's another thing um, is I'm gradually developing pretty large following there um and yes and I, I will link to all of these things yes so we got to get yeah. you over on instagram <laughs> yeah so so <laughs> far i don't do instagram or twitter or all of those kinds of things i uh, i have to limit to some degree my yes. involvement with all of these kinds of social yes. media things. but i do i am on facebook and that's another way to follow me um so the, yeah Awesome. I will link to all of those things. Thank you so much for coming. It was such an awesome time talking to you. Thank you for having me. It's been a, a, an enjoyable discussion. Thank you.